Hello and welcome to GameSack. Over the years, I've often been asked what kind of equipment I use to make the show. A couple of episodes ago, I took a look at some video upscalers and I figured now would be as good as time as any to take a look at some video capture devices. Now in early 2011, when GameSack first started, it wasn't uncommon for YouTube channels to basically just screen cap off of an emulator. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to show people real games running on real hardware, and that meant getting the gameplay into the computer, which wasn't always the easiest thing to do. At first, I was using this, the Sony DVMC-DA1 Media Converter. I had owned this for years at this point in order to capture my old analog tapes and whatnot. Basically, this takes analog composite or S-video signals in NTSC or PAL plus stereo audio and converts it into the DV codec, the same data stream used in mini DV camcorders and the like. This is sent via Firewire, otherwise known as IEEE 1394, to my Mac and captured as a 720x480i QuickTime file right in Final Cut Pro 7, or any Final Cut Pro version actually. And that's really all that this little device does, convert an analog signal to digital. It treats 240p video as 480i, but since GameSack was 30 frames per second at the time, you couldn't see any shimmering caused by the forced interlacing. If you place those files on a 60 frames per second timeline though, then you will get all 60 frames, or fields rather, without any combing artifacts. The good news here is that if a game switches from 240p to 480i or the other way around, that is absolutely seamless and there's no way to trip this device up. Unfortunately, the DV codec just isn't very good at all. The blues are very low resolution, as are the reds, as DV is a 411 codec. That means green gets the priority of the data, whereas blue and red gets less because those colors are less important to human eyes. I captured all of the gameplay this way for nearly a year, both for my gameplay and for the games that Dave talked about. Eventually, my boss gave me this, the Sony DSR25 DV Cam VCR. It also captures analog in the same way and converts it to the DV codec via Firewire. In fact, I'd say that the overall quality is ever so slightly better than the DVMC-DA1, but at least Dave was finally able to capture his own gameplay, taking some of the workload off of me. The first video capture device I ever spent a lot of money on, specifically for video games, was the Blackmagic Intensity Pro from, well, Blackmagic Design. This is a PCIe card with HDMI in and out as well as a multi-purpose analog port. This uses the Blackmagic Media Express software to capture, and it writes the video as an Apple ProRes QuickTime file, which is still the video industry standard to this day. The app is pretty good, but you'll need to select the exact frame rate and resolution of your source before you can see it. The capture window is also fast enough where you can actually play your game looking at it. Well, most games anyway. For me, this was the only way I could capture gameplay in HD at the time. Unfortunately, the intensity tops out at 720p 60 frames per second when it comes to game capture. This was pretty much fine back then. It can do 1080i, but I wasn't interested in capturing interlaced video. Still, it does a great job for the formats that it can capture. Unfortunately, it won't see 240p signals at all for most retro game consoles. The software and firmware was updated regularly, and eventually it could see 240p, such as this from the Saturn, but only if it were running at the exact broadcast specifications when it came to the frame rate. However, the actual captured file runs at twice the speed as it should, which of course renders it completely unusable. It just doesn't understand 240p. Games that are interlaced, like Virtua Fighter 2 though, capture fine in 480i or 525i as Blackmagic calls it. One great thing about the intensity is that it can capture full 7.1 surround sound audio discreetly and it's not limited to stereo like other wimpy capture devices. Seriously, other manufacturers of capture devices really need to step up their game in the audio department. I also purchased a Blackmagic Intensity Shuttle Thunderbolt which works exactly like the Pro in every single regard except that it's external. Neither device will work with the FrameMeister, even if it's outputting 720p in any of its modes. Unfortunately, the extremely strict adherence to broadcast specs means that you pay more and get a lot less when it comes to Blackmagic's line of capture devices.
Man, talking about these devices and using them again really takes me back to the early days of the show. And yes, being on the Mac platform kind of limits my options. So I figured I'd bring in the guys from the cool channel, My Life in Gaming, to discuss the capture devices that they've used and their experiences with them. So for now, I'll hand it off to Corey, who's going to talk about the Pex HD Cap. <laughs> what a stupid name, Corey. Believe it or not, when Try and I set out to record the best possible gameplay from original console hardware, we had no intention of starting a YouTube channel. It's just that after we had dumped all this time, money, and effort into our setups, it made sense to like just do something with it. So we started My Life in Gaming in 2013. We spent the first couple of months making pristine, razor-sharp game capture look as bad as possible by dubbing it the VHS tapes before we found our true niche, breaking down what we learned from testing, research, and tons and tons of trial and error to help people get the best video quality from their original game systems on their high-definition televisions. For a while, MyComSoft's XRGB Mini Frame Meister seemed like it was the end game, but over the years, it's turned into a bottomless pit of upscaling devices, console mods, video cables, and of course, capture cards to record the footage with. Like Joe, I spent a lot of money on a Blackmagic design capture card. In my case, it was the Intensity Pro, an internal capture and output PCI card that worked great with sixth generation consoles. But since Blackmagic makes broadcast level devices, they adhere strictly to professional standards. And if I've learned anything since I've gotten into all this stuff, it's that classic consoles didn't always respect these standards. Thanks to a tutorial on videogameperfection.com, I was enlightened on StarTech's PEX HD Cap, an internal capture card that accepts HDMI, DVI, and analog audio and component video signals via a dongle that connects to a DIN-style input. This is great but the big appeal of this card is just how willing it is to work with a number of resolutions, ranging from 240p up to 1080i. It also handles various off-spec refresh rates like a Pro, making it essentially perfect for retro consoles. In fact, it works so well that I later upgraded to a newer version of the same card, the PEX HD Cap 60L, which added 1080p 60 support, making it a great choice for modern consoles as well. From an input point of view, the main differences between these cars is that the 60L loses the dedicated HDMI port, forcing you to use a DVI to HDMI adapter. However, it does accept composite and S-Video using a separate dongle, which might be useful for you. I wish I could give you a closer look at this Streamcatcher video capture program, but it was flash-based, and as of January 12th, 2021, it stopped working completely. I can't even open the thing. I had to switch over to Amarac and OBS after Streamcatcher went silently into the night, which I guess isn't exactly a bad thing. People who might not love their capture card's native recording application should give either a try. I was personally hesitant to use OBS for more than live streaming, but I changed my tune once I figured out how to get it set up just the way I wanted for recording. It should be noted though, that these cards only accept the video input. There is no HDMI pass-through that you can route to your display. Unless you want to play in the lag-prone capture window, you're going to need an HDMI splitter if you want to play on a TV and capture simultaneously. The main reason these cards have such robust versatility is because they share the same hardware with MyComSoft's line of X-Capture devices. What I found to be the greatest asset of the PEX HDCAP 60L is that it works exceedingly well with the open-source scan converter which I found that most older capture cards tend to really struggle with. The OSSC has been my primary upscaling device for the last several years, and the 60L has been a real workhorse, handling pass-through 240p to the 5x scale modes. The 60L received an upgraded version a couple years ago called the 60L2, but I'm not even sure what the improvements are. But if you're looking for a USB device, there is a USB 3 version of this same card that is around $70, $80 cheaper. Uh, I personally prefer the reliability of an internal card, but you might feel differently. Oh. 
In early 2014, I picked up one of these pieces of trash. That's right, this is the Mac Pro Trash Can. Every episode of GameStack since then has been edited on this thing, including, well, this one that you're watching right now. Anyway, because this is stupid, it can't take PCIe cards, which means that every kind of capture device I use from then on out has to be external. Let me show you what I got. Meanwhile, back at GameSack, I ended up getting the external Elgato HD60. Actually, two of them, one for Dave. These connect via USB 2. Wow, remember USB 2? If you do, your old is dirt, and you should feel bad. Note that this is the HD60, not the HD60S or the S+. That means that this has an internal H.264 encoder built right inside. That means your computer doesn't have to do the work. Also, this came with a free copy of Tom Clancy's The Division on PS4 for some reason. I wonder if Tom Clancy owns an Elgato HD60. Anyway, I played it once and it wasn't bad, but you're required to be connected to the internet, which is pretty dumb. I'll ask you to please find the lie in that statement. The HD60 has an HDMI input and output so you can monitor your gameplay on an external TV. It also features an analog audio input just in case you have a need for such a thing. Unfortunately, the HDMI loop through is temperamental and the monitor will sometimes lose signal for a bit. Elgato's Game Capture HD software has a setting to help this, but it's very vague on explaining what it does and it doesn't seem to help much at all. Because of that, I just use an HDMI splitter and bypass the HD60's HDMI output completely. The Game Capture HD app works pretty well otherwise, creating MP4 files with H.264 encoding at up to 1080p and 60 frames per second. Cranked all the way up, the files usually clock in with a data rate of anywhere between 40 and 50 megabits per second. They look pretty good. This was the daily driver on GameSack for many years for both myself and Dave, and it captured everything that the FrameMeister threw at it. In fact, it only ever lost sync when the FrameMeister lost sync. Of course, I love that I had the ability to capture at 1080p and 60 frames per second, which I was never able to do before I got this. The only downfalls for me is that it refuses to see 960p output from the OSSC and OBS won't see it because Elgato won't create drivers for the Mac. However, supposedly the HD60S and S Plus resolve both of these issues with the installation of the OBS Link app from Elgato. Sadly, that app won't see the plain old HD60. Why not? Well, because that's the one I own, that's why. Besides that, this has been a very reliable little device for me over the years that still works well if I need it to. I eventually found an external Avermedia solution for my trash can. Well, actually, solution might be too strong of a word, but first I want to send it back to Corey so he can talk about his internal Avermedia experiences. Man, I wish I could install PCIe cards inside this. I don't know, Corey. You think you can get it inside mine? Before I bought the PEX HD Cap 60L, if I ever needed to capture 1080p gameplay, then my go to was the Extreme Cap U3 from Avermedia. It worked great with modern consoles and the FrameMeister, but once the OSSC was in play, then all bets were off. It didn't work at all. But when it came time to add the ability to capture 4K gameplay, then I went back to the Avermedia fold and bought the Live Gamer 4K. Being 4K focused, this internal capture card has no time for silly analog connections and simply has two HDMI ports. One for video input that accepts a variety of resolutions up to 4K60, while the other passes through a virtually lagless signal to your TV for playing, eliminating the need for an HDMI splitter. This device can also handle lower resolutions at higher frame rates, which is something that I've never really had a need for, but could be important for you if you capture PC games or just want to take advantage of the 120 FPS modes in the newer consoles. The other big key feature is HDR support, which stands for High Dynamic Range. If you choose to record footage in HDR, keep in mind that the viewer will need a display that supports it, or else the image will look all washed out with a gray hue to it. What's cool about the Live Gamer is that if you want to play in HDR but want to capture gameplay in standard dynamic range, it will apply the color information to the capture to make it look correct, a process called tone mapping. It's not always perfect, but I'm guessing you won't notice in most cases. 
Avermedia's recording program, Rec Central, has gone through some big changes since I first used it with my Extreme Cap U3. It gives you plenty of quality options for you to adjust, such as resolution, bitrate, and frame rate. Depending on your GPU, you can even record an H.265 HEVC. While the quality to file size ratio is amazing, I experienced occasional compression glitches from time to time. If you want to stay away from Rec Central, the 4K works seamlessly in OBS. Even the HDR tone mapping works properly. As an aside, one of my favorite uses of the Live Gamer 4K is to hook my Panasonic GH5 DSLR camera up to it via HDMI and record 4K B-roll directly to my PC when I'm in a time crunch. Compatibility with different retro gaming scalers is decent, but is also where we run into some snags. As I've learned over the course of the last couple of years, it's far from perfect in this category. Many of the OSSC's higher resolutions aren't supported natively by the Live Gamer, so instead of just preventing you from recording at all, the card will scale the video to the nearest appropriate resolution it likes. I've used the OSSC's 960p mode heavily over the years, since it's a great catch-all for upscaling tons of different resolutions. The Avermedia doesn't like this resolution, and while it'll see and display the correct resolution in Rec Central, the file you'll generate from recording will be 1280 by 1024, which stretches the image slightly vertically. Sure, the Live Gamer works with the OSSC's 5X mode, which can be a rarity in capture cards, but using any of the 5X formats outside of 1920 by 1080, such as 1200p, will be inexplicably forced by the card to 2560 by 1440. I wonder if Avermedia could add more resolutions to this card. It's super annoying. Just like many other capture cards, the Live Gamer struggles with the SNES and NES through certain scalers. You might experience occasional video drops or sound hitches that cause the audio in the recorded file to go out of sync. Heck, this can even happen with the PEX HD cap from time to time. However, if you get your hands on a RetroTINK 5X, using the amazing triple buffer mode will smooth out most of these issues at the cost of about one frame of input lag. I'd say it's worth the trade-off. The Avermedia Live Gamer 4K is an amazing card in most circumstances, and if your focus is on modern systems, then it's really a no-brainer. It's just that the retro stuff has a few tiny issues to work around that might be annoying from time to time. This here is the Avermedia Live Gamer Portable 2. At the time I bought this, I was lured in by the ability to record straight to a micro SD card, which meant that I didn't even need to have it tethered to my computer. Heck, I could capture gameplay anywhere. Unfortunately, when it captures to the SD card, it does so at an extremely low bitrate, which is rather concerning. In the Avermedia app called Rec Central Express, you can adjust the quality that it records to the card. Even at the best setting, it makes recordings that are only about 20 megabits per second, which is pretty low for 1080p 60 frames per second content, especially if you want to edit it. Surprisingly, it looks okay, but not quite as sharp as the Elgato HD60. For me, it's just going to get re-encoded when I export it and then re-encoded again when I upload it. It's always best to have your source file as high quality as possible. Using the Live Gamer Portable 2 connected via USB 2 to the computer, you can use the Rec Central Express to capture your gameplay. What's nice is that the capture window features very little lag, so you can actually play most games without the need to loop the HDMI out of the device itself. Ultimately, the data rate is still extremely low at around 12 megabits per second, which is even worse. It also records in a slightly goofy flavor of H.264. Adobe Premiere likes it, but Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve both hate it. So for me to use the file, I have to convert it with Handbrake first. The overall result is still pretty soft and it's just not worth it. The good news is that OBS sees it, which means if I wanted to, I could record the output in ProRes like the gods intended. I've used this device for streaming a couple of times since OBS likes it, and I also used it to capture some PlayStation VR games, but other than that, I feel this really isn't the device for me.
Now, Corey is way too polite to mention that he didn't exactly have a world-class experience with Avermedia's customer service team. Well, I'm not polite at all, so I don't mind saying it for him. Actually, all he did was ask for more resolutions and they just didn't respond. Anyway, let's take a look at another interesting device that doesn't need to be tethered to a computer. Well, interesting on paper anyway. About a year ago maybe, a company that makes the Cloner Alliance Box Pro offered to send me one of their devices in for review. This one allows you to record to external storage, so I was excited. Sadly, it didn't live up to any of my hopes at all, so I never bothered reviewing it. Well, I am now, I guess. The device comes with a nicely labeled remote to help things out. It has an HDMI input as well as output, plus another HDMI connection if you want to hook up analog devices, including VGA. Though this only uses HDMI as a connector, it's not actually converting your analog to HDMI with this dongle. In the menu, you can adjust the settings to allow for a bitrate at up to 16 megabits per second. Yeah, that's pretty low. You connect your storage device via USB, but it has to be formatted as FAT32. They say you can also use NTFS, but they recommend FAT32 over that. This means that long recordings are split up if they grow over 2 gigabytes in size. Kind of weird since FAT32 has a file size limits of 4 gigs, so I'm not sure why they split it every 2 gigs. As a result of the low bitrate, a lot of details in your capture can get lost. But that's not this device's biggest sin, oh no. You see, it only records at 30 frames per second. It simply throws away half of your frames. Yikes and no thanks. Interestingly, you can schedule recordings in the menu system if you want to use it like a DVR. If you hook it up to your PC via USB and press the PC button, OBS won't see it. So yeah, this thing definitely is not for video games. When Elgato announced the 4K 60S Plus standalone unit, I was absolutely stoked. Stoked enough to spend $400 on this thing. It seemed like everything I wanted. It records directly to an SD card. It can record 4K resolutions at up to 60 frames per second, and it can even capture HDR. The captures look great, though it can't capture anything more than 60 frames per second, nor can it do anything better than stereo. Not only that, but everything is extremely configurable by means of a text file which lives on the SD card that you insert. With this text file, you can change a lot of options, like the container file that you'd prefer, the codec, and even assign a bitrate for each individual resolution, so long as your SD card is fast enough. Also really cool is that the audio can be recorded as PCM if I want, which means no compression at all. When I got it though, I ended up having some issues with it. It worked mostly fine for modern consoles, but boy oh boy did it hate the Framemeister. Not only that, but when recording retro game systems, the audio would drift out of sync rather quickly, especially on the NES and the Super NES. Play for too long and the audio would be dozens of seconds out of sync on your capture. Yikes, that's no good. It also has a hard time waking up, and it's just overall very slow to respond to anything and everything. This device is in a hurry to do absolutely nothing. The old Elgato HD60 was much more forgiving in the types of signals that it could accept when it came to retro consoles. After way too many emails, I was finally able to get hold of someone at Elgato Tech Support in Germany where they designed this stuff. They sent a few firmware updates for me to try. After that, they told me to add this code to my settings.txt, which adjusts the audio drift problem. With this line in here and the interval set to 1, it resets the audio sync every single second, so drift is no longer an issue. So that's awesome! There's no publicly available firmware for this unit in Elgato's Windows app or on their website. I think you have to have them send it to you, which is pretty dumb. So I'm not sure if this audio drift fix will help you or not if you can't get updated firmwares without asking. After this, they had me try to update my firmware once more, which bricked my unit. So they sent me another one with that firmware update already applied. The unit still gets confused and takes forever to sync, and it will make your TV drop pictures several times just inserting a card as it gets ready. Fortunately, thanks to the RetroTINK 5X, the Elgato 4K 60S Plus has fewer issues since the 5X never drops out like the Framemeister did. Check out my video from a few weeks ago about upscalers for more information on that. 
Suffice it to say that the RetroTINK 5X makes using the 4K 60S Plus far more usable. However, it still has issues waking up sometimes. Oftentimes I'll have to unplug and replug the power just to wake the stupid thing up. Elgato tells me that this unit goes into a deep sleep because of some European laws regarding power consumption. Thanks Europe for making things less good for everyone else. I would also prefer a tactile record button instead of this touch sensitive nonsense because you never know if the unit registers your touch or not. As for video recording, it does an excellent job with the settings as I have them. It records in 720p, 1080p, and 2160p just like it claims. There are settings for 1440p in the settings.txt, but sadly it will not see 1440p video at all. Actually it will if you use the 4K Capture Utility app on Windows, but if you're just using it as a standalone unit with an SD card in there, nope, it's not going to see it. Nor will it see 960p from an OSSC. Unfortunately, OBS doesn't see it at all when using the Mac. Elgato refuses to make Mac software for the 4K 60S Plus for some reason, but I bought it for the SD card functionality anyway. Maybe they're not very confident in this product, so they don't want to pour any resources into software development if they don't have to. Still, with a RetroTINK 5X, this is pretty much my new daily driver for game captures. <laughs> Well, it turns out that Corey is just a wee bit upset with me for sharing something with you that he told me in the strictest of confidence about the Avermedia customer service experience. Now he doesn't want to talk about the new Magewell 4K capture card he just got. Rather than apologize, I figured I'd turn to the other half of the My Life and Gaming team, Try. And so Try is going to try to talk about the Magewell Pro Capture HDMI 4K Plus. I think I got that right. When I got my LG C7 TV in 2017, it not only opened up 4K gaming for me with the last generation's PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, but it also turned out to be highly compatible with 4X and even 5X output from the OSSC. But while my TV was cool with 960p, 1200p, and 2160p, I didn't have a capture card that could handle any of that. But one brand I had heard really good things about in terms of accepting just about every oddball signal that was thrown its way was Magewell. So I dug deep into my bank account and bought the Magewell Pro Capture HDMI 4K Plus. The version I have is a little older and does not have an HDMI pass-through feature, but the newer LT version otherwise performs the same as the model I'm showing here. Oh, and beware. The way cheaper non-plus 4K Magewells are HDMI 1.4, which means 4K at 30 hertz. Cause see, even if a game is capped at 30 FPS, consoles still output at least 60 hertz. So 30 hertz is not good enough. But if you're dead set on 120 hertz capture, this card will not support that at 4K. After getting over the initial investment, I've continued to be impressed with how well this card has adapted to essentially every weird upscaled retro signal I've thrown at it. And thanks to its end-to-end -end 444 color bandwidth, it really stands up to pixel peeping scrutiny. Magewell does offer its own capture software, which seems pretty good from the limited bit I've used of it, but since I'm so used to recording in OBS, I mostly just use that. Basically, I've built individual profiles and scene collections that relate to various OSSC and RetroTINK 5X modes that I'm likely to use. Plus, you know, normal people stuff like 720p, 1080p, and 2160p. This lets me go into the card's properties and enter the resolution manually per profile, which is important due to a little quirk. Let's say you were sending the Magewell a 1080p signal when it was first initialized, but then you send it 2160p from another console. It will display the 2160p source, but at 1080p quality. So to me, the unique profiles per capture scenario are just the easiest way to be sure I'm recording exactly what I intend to. However, I do recommend going into the card properties and choosing full range or limited range manually since auto detection seems to not work. Now, sometimes I care more about saving hard drive space than I care about capturing a 4K source and actual 2160p. 
in which case I can simply record on the profile where I've set the mage wall for 1920 by 1080. This makes it so that the downscale occurs within the mage wall hardware rather than using up other system resources. Lately, I've actually been tinkering around with the reverse. Check out what happens if I set the scale filtering to point and then fill a 2560 by 1440p canvas with a 720p source or do the same with a 3840 by 2160 canvas. I'm actually thinking about recording 720p stuff like this going forward. And well, you know, you could actually do this with any 720p capable card, really. Avermedia and Elgato's 4K HDR cards are probably way more practical than Magewell if you're mostly only concerned with current gen stuff. But my Magewell can work there too, thanks to a firmware update that added HDR10 support. However, it is a bit technical and fiddly to get it working and you may need to request a special EDID from Magewell. Even then, you'll have to apply a lot to tone map color information in either OBS or in your editing tools, which might be a bit more involved than most people want to get. But it is a really, really powerful card and can be easy to use for most things, but I just haven't fully embraced it for HDR recording yet although that could change if I figure out how to get the feature working with a bit less hassle. But you know, if 4K capture just isn't even on your radar yet, I know that Joe's been using an external Magewell device that might suit your needs without having to spend, you know, nearly a thousand freaking dollars. Thank you, Tribe. I do indeed have a Magewell device. Now, it's not as fancy as the Pro Capture HDMI 4K Plus, but I do really like it. I didn't want to spend as much as Tri did on his internal Magewell card, yet I still wanted something simple and powerful that would work with my computer. So I ended up getting the Magewell USB Capture HDMI Gen 2. You simply hook an HDMI cable into one end and a USB 3 cable into the other. Then, you use the Magewell USB Capture Utility, which is available for both Windows and Mac, to set it up. Thank you, Magewell, for thinking of your customers. I appreciate that. Here is where you set the resolution and the frame rate. It can capture resolutions up to 2048 by 2160, but it can't capture HDR. While you can put in multiple different resolutions and frame rates over on the left column and save it to the device, it will only ever use the starred one even if your input is different. It'll up or downscale to whatever you have selected. So you have to be very specific on what you select. Magewell has a capture utility for Windows, but not for Mac. The good news is that this device is driverless, so I can use virtually anything to capture. I usually use QuickTime to capture with the settings on maximum, and that gives me ProRes 422 files. The capture window is fast enough to play most games while looking at it. Playing them well might be another story though. What's more is that this is the first capture device I've ever owned that can see 960p from the OSSC. I just set up a 960p preset and input the refresh rate listed on the OSSC's display, which depends on the console, save it to the device, and I get perfect captures. Most of the time. The OSSC is never consistent in what it reports and often quite inaccurate, so it's best to use reference frame rates that you know are correct, like these. The only bad thing is trying to capture NES and Super NES games, which actually run slightly faster than 60 frames per second. As a result, you can get some black frames inserted on the 8 and 16-bit Nintendo consoles. It doesn't matter what you set your frame rate to, this device has trouble with Nintendo systems at their native frame rate. Fortunately, if you use a RetroTINK 5X instead of an OSSC and set it to triple buffer mode, this is not an issue at all. The only other bad thing is that it can only capture in stereo. It will see all of the channels of an HDMI device, but will only ever capture the left and right channels no matter what you do. This could be QuickTime's fault, however, and not the Magewell's. This is a very simple yet very powerful little device. Well, there you go, a bunch of capture devices along with their quirks and advantages. I am super happy that the capture device technology continues to advance, which technology tends to do, but I'm glad that it happens. Anyway, do you have a favorite capture device or do you just not have any use for them at all? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameZack.
Hey! Huh? You still don't have a Sega CD? Well, actually, I do. What are you doing? Waiting for Nintendo to make one? See, I even have two. This is the Model 2. You have seen the games, haven't you? Uh, I guess not. Wrong answer, man. Huh? Show them! <laughs> Wanna see more? <laughs> You want to see more? Oh, please. Take it out!